Great. Well, it looks like we're at the top of the hour, so let's go ahead and jump in. Welcome to today's WCET webcast. My name is Megan Raymond. I'm the Assistant Director of Programs and Sponsorship here at w WCET. Next slide, please. Today's webinar is Insights from Key Stakeholders, and this is part two in the State Authorization Network webcast series. Next slide. As we go through, if you have any questions at all, go ahead and enter them into the chat box or the question box. We'll get to those questions as we have time. We'll likely save those till the end so that we don't interrupt anybody's presentation. If we don't get to all of the questions that are asked today, we'll be sure to pull those questions out, share them with our presenters, and then get written responses back to you. The webcast is being recorded, and if you'd like to, you could follow along with the slides by clicking the handout pane and downloading the PDF there. Again, this is being recorded. We will share a link to the recording, the slides, and any additional resources next week. Next slide, please. With that, I'd like to go ahead and pass it over to Cheryl and she can run us through the overview and then we'll move on to the rest of the presentation. So again, thank you for joining us. Be sure to ask your questions via the question box, any other comments through the chat box. We'll be sure to monitor that and respond as we can. Thank you very much, Megan. Uh, this is Cheryl Dowd. I'm the director for the State Authorization Network with WCET and uh, welcome to part two of our key stakeholders series. Um, and part two is in regard to key, the insights from the key stakeholders. So I'm very pleased today to be able to have um, a member of our uh, SAN, she's a SAN colleague and I'll be introducing her in a second. But what we're going to be doing today is offering for you the uh, the a list of folks that are key stakeholders at an institution. So you'll be able to see all of the folks that they have brought together to help promote a compliance plan at the institution. We talk a lot about the importance of having a compliance plan and reaching out beyond our offices to be able to gain the assistance of others at our institutions. So today we thought it would be helpful for you all to hear from the actual key stakeholders themselves. Last week, we started with the importance of key stakeholders from the compliance staff person's standpoint. And today, we're able to bring you what the key stakeholders um, beyond the compliance office believe are important aspects for the compliance plan. So we'll start off with some introductions in just a second. And then we will go through each of these key stakeholders. We have six or seven today. And then we will be taking questions at the end of the webinar. As Megan was explaining, we are going to hold the questions until the end of the um, webinar. And at the end of the webinar, we'll take these questions and we will look in the, ch in the chat box and question box. You'll see that in the um, dashboard. It says uh, questions. You can enter your questions there. We'll keep an eye on those. And uh, we will provide time at the end to be able to take the questions. If we do not get to all of the questions, those questions will be held for us to be able to reach back to our presenters to get answers to your questions. And when we send out the, um, the recording of the webinar, we'll be able to send the answers out to those questions as well that weren't um, addressed. And that's me. I'm Cheryl Dowd. I'm the director for the State Authorization Network SAN with WCET. And then at this point, I'm going to pass it over to Leslie Weibush. She is with The Ohio State University. She's the program manager of state authorization. And she was able to bring together a group of people that she coordinated and, and organized to be able to help them with their compliance plan at their institution. And so, Leslie, I'm going to, uh, before I get to you, I'd like to go through who the other folks are that are at her institution. So, as I said, we have Leslie. She serves as the program manager of state authorization at The Ohio State University, educating university stakeholders of state, territory, NC SARA, and professional licensing board requirements. She and her team spearheaded the creation and implementation of a university-wide out-of-state educational activities policy, educating units of state authorization requirements for conducting business outside of Ohio. Wybush serves as co-founder and active leader of the State Authorization Network of Ohio, SANO, 
a mentor and presenter for WCET's State Authorization Network, and has presented at several national conferences. After Leslie, we'll be moving to uh, Lisa, who is the Senior Program Coordinator of State Authorization at The Ohio State University. In her current role, she works toward institutional compliance by seeking and maintaining regulatory and professional licensing board approvals nationwide. Lisa earned her Bachelor of Science degree from Ohio State University prior to earning her paralegal certificate from Capital University Law School. Then we'll move to Mary McLaughlin, who is a career development professional in the College of Food, Agriculture, and Environmental Sciences at Ohio State. In her role, she assists students in connecting with opportunities to grow their skills and to expand their professional networks. Additionally, she manages data on the college internship programs. She has worked to develop an internship tracking system in the college to capture information on student internships, including location of the internship, which has aided in streamlining reporting of out-of-state activities for state authorization. When she's not at work, she enjoys hiking, tennis, and cooking with her husband, Andrew. Brandon, who we will move to after that, is um, she, he advises and counsels the university on a wide range of faculty matters, as well as issues facing the Office of Academic Affairs and other litigation and labor and employment issues. Prior to joining Ohio State, Brandon practiced labor and employment law in the Pittsburgh office of Jones Day, where he represented employers in individual and class litigation over discrimination wage and hour whistleblower and other issues. He handled labor arbitration and counseled clients on labor and regulatory issues. He previously served as the Simon Karras Fellow Deputy Solicitor in the Appeals Section of the Ohio Attorney General's Office, where he briefed and argued civil and criminal matters before the United States Supreme Court and the Supreme Court of Ohio. He has also worked as a law clerk for the Honorable Chief Justice Thomas Moyer of the Supreme Court of Ohio. Brandon graduated from the Ohio State University Moritz College of Law in 2005 and completed a certificate in alternative dispute resolution. In 2010, he was honored with the Moritz uh, College of Law's Outstanding Recent Alumnus Award for his service work to the community and the university. Ansel Oakleaf has been is our next presenter and has been a member of the OSU IRP office since April of 2012. Ansel has worked in institutional research for over nine years. Prior to working at OSU, Ansel had been an assistant registrar, testing coordinator, academic advisor, instructor of religious studies, mathematics and computer science, and a park ranger. As an IR professional, Ansel has been an IPEDS key holder and coordinator, assisted with P20 Council in Arizona, was active with the Arizona State System for Information of Student Transfer, the ASIST, pro, or ASIST program, A-S-S-I-S-T, uh, National Student Clearinghouse. At OSU, Ansel works with student HR and course data. Ansel's focus is on data collection and analysis, Delaware study and NSSE. Ansel has expertise in working with multiple data systems and tools, Banner, PeopleSoft, Argos, OBIEE, ODBC, MySQL, Tableau, SAS, SAS, and SPSS. Then we will go to Dennis Cleary, who is an assistant professor. He is, Dr. Cleary has nearly 20 years of experience providing occupational therapy services to children and adults with intellectual and development disabilities. He is an assistant professor in, in the Division of Occupational Therapy at The Ohio State University. He's a director of curriculum and is responsible for coordinating over 300 student clinical placements each year in Ohio, nationally and internationally. He co-directs the Transition Employment and Technology Laboratory, whose mission is to improve employment outcomes through the creation and refinement of novel assessment and intervention tools. Dr. Cleary has been the principal or co-principal investigator of over five, um, $5 million in grants and state federal agencies. Ryan Hunt serves as the Associate Registrar for Academic Records and Course Scheduling at Ohio State University. He is also leading the Records, Enrollment, and Curriculum team for the Enterprise Project, Ohio State's project implementing Workday as the new HR, Finance, and Student Information Systems. He previously worked as a Registrar at Cincinnati State Community College. He earned his Bachelor and Master's degree at Northern Arizona University. Then we will be going to Skylar. Skylar Fott is the Marketing Communications Specialist in the Office of Distance Education and E-Learning at The Ohio State University. 
Working at the university for a year, her role consists of supporting the distance education team to expand their reach university-wide through communications effort like storytelling, social media, and email marketing. With a passion for relationship building and digital communications, Fought has been successfully bridging the gap between her client's work and the impact it has at Ohio State. And finally, we have, um, I'm sorry, I don't have her name, uh, it, it, with the OSU alumni and with a master's in educational studies. She began her field of financial aid in the late 80s as a private institution at the private institution and came to OSU in 2011. Her current role at Associate Director of Compliance and Athletic Aid, she oversees all compliance efforts for the Student Financial Aid Office, including the athletic aid process. This involves ensuring established policies and procedures are in place and in compliance with applicable federal, state, NCAA, Big Ten, and institutional requirements. Partnering with programs such as the state authorization team is critical for contributing to a strong compliance culture at a large university such as Ohio State. Okay, that was a lot of people that I just shared with you. And the reason for sharing all of them in, in the beginning, which we will get to their specific relationship to the, to the team that uh, Leslie has coordinated, is, the, is that what we can see here is that a what is considered a, uh, sometimes a decentralized, very large institution, they have been able to create relationships across the institution with a wide variety of different offices and staff members. So uh, that they can address all of the different aspects of state authorization for their compliance process. So at this time, I'd like to turn it over to Leslie, who will introduce the uh, different presenters that we have today. Thank you, Leslie, for assembling this group and, uh, and for being with us today. Thank you, Cheryl. That was quite the introduction. Um, similarly aligned to what Cheryl was just talking about, um, you know, one of the biggest pieces of state authorization is truly relationship building. It's a key component to being successful in this role. And, you know, coming from my perspective and relating with all of you, it can be very overwhelming, regardless of the size of your institution. You know, you have to be intentional and it takes a large portion of time and effort but it can pay dividends in the long run by really establishing those close relationships. Um, I specifically remember that overwhelming feeling when I started in my role, not really sure where to begin connecting the dots. Um, I was fortunate enough to have a good supervisor that was able to help guide me to the critical stakeholders within each unit. Um, and I, then I was able to slowly chip away department by department, identifying who I needed to work with. So, Today's uh, presentation really highlights and emphasizes those critical relationships from the beginning that I had to establish in order for our state authorization team to be successful. So with that, I have our first presenter, Lisa Seeker. Uh, Lisa works on my team as the state authorization uh, senior program coordinator. And to give you a little bit of context, uh, when I was hired at OSU, I did a quick assessment on the state authorization work that needed to be completed and just really realized that I needed a competent staff member that could help assist in obtaining the state and professional licensing board approvals. Um, I was very fortunate to find Lisa, who was a paralegal and had the background of in, uh, researching casinos that were opening in Ohio. So she helped really spearhead that research uh, when that was taking place in Ohio. And it eerily became very similar to state authorization when she was talking about it. So I knew that she would be um, perfect for the role. Um, and I've asked Lisa to provide her perspective today. I'm basically starting out this line of work with no experience in state authorization, highlighting some of the work that she does currently, and more importantly, providing her perspective on forming relationships with stakeholders around the university. So I'm going to turn it over to Lisa to give her highlights. All right. Well, thank you, Leslie, for that introduction. Um, I'm happy to be here to share my perspective um, with state authorization at Ohio State. And I started in this role about two years ago. And as Leslie mentioned, I was new to both higher education and state authorization at that time. And as I look back to when I started here, I realized that I was very lucky to be working with Leslie as the program manager. 
um, because Leslie had been here for about a year, I think, when I started, and she had already started to establish um, those stakeholder connections that we're talking about. And one of the things that I appreciated most and found helpful um, when I started at Ohio State was attending stakeholder consultations and meetings with Leslie. Um, for example, when a new online program was approved, we would meet face-to-face -face with that program contact and provide our background information and authorization maps um, and talk through how state authorization would apply to that particular program. And those consultations really helped me to get up to speed on issues at the university and to learn what my role was here. Um, so at those consultations, we would kind of ask questions to learn more about each program um, to determine whether there were on-ground components or whether licensure might be involved. Um, and we really focused on staying positive in our communications by ex explaining how we could help um, the program stay in compliance instead of focusing on what that program can't do or where they can't offer um, the program. So I think whether you're at a large institution like we are or a small institution, having that face-to-face -face meeting where you can demonstrate how your website works and find the status of a program is really important to establishing that relationship and starting to collaborate and build trust with your stakeholders. Um, another way that we built those relationships that I wanted to talk about was through the development of our policy, which Cheryl had mentioned before. Um, it's called the Out-of-State Educational Activities Policy. And as part of that policy development process, um, knowing that maybe not all stakeholders would be supportive of the policy or might be skeptical, we invited faculty and staff to participate on the policy writing committee. And we went through quite a few drafts um, and requested feedback along the way after each draft was revised. And we hosted some educational sessions and webinars that we advertised across the university. And basically, we just tried to reach out to as many stakeholders as we could throughout that policy development process. Um, it was really helpful to be transparent in our goals with the policy, which was university-wide compliance and just to try to make sure stakeholders were included all along the way. And we found that the feedback we got through that process was really valuable because we were getting perspectives from faculty and staff across the university, and we were able to understand some different points of view and address some concerns in the policy through that feedback. So the policy was a good tool to put some guidelines in place and it also helped us to stay in contact with our stakeholders by defining some state authorization liaisons. Um, and we define those liaisons in each college and unit. And the role of those liaisons was to serve as a contact point between our team and the liaison staff so that the liaison can then educate their staff about state authorization. So in a large university like this, it's really helpful to have those defined um, contact points. And the policy also created a state authorization advisory committee, which is a group of faculty, staff, and students who we meet with every month. Um, and we discuss state authorization issues as they come up. And the committee members help us to decide on a strategy to deal with those issues. And we found that the feedback we get from those committee meetings is also really valuable. And the committee members um, represent all different units at the university, and they bring up points that we wouldn't have thought of without them. And aside from those committee meetings, um, other ways that we grow relationships at the university is just continuing to provide those consultations with staff. Um, we meet with internship coordinators when they have questions about reporting or data collection. 
and we provide information through regular webinars. Um, we also meet every week with our communications staff to talk through communication strategy and outreach. And in line with that, I draft monthly newsletters that we send to a listserv. And we draft news articles for our website also that just highlight the status of regulations, SARA news, and um, other state authorization updates. Um, and finally, as another part of our outreach efforts, our team manages three state authorization websites now that target three different audiences. Um, we have an online student website. Uh, we manage a website just for faculty and staff. And we just launched a website for traditional students um, who are enrolled in on-campus programs. So that is a quick overview of how we maintain our stakeholder relationships here. And now I will turn it back to Leslie. Thank you, Lisa. Great job. Um, next, I'm going to turn it over to Brandon Lester, who is our basically our, our general counsel for state authorization that we bounce ideas off of. So, Brandon, I'm going to hand it over to you. Yeah, thanks so much, Leslie. Uh, so, when you're in a general counsel's office at a university, um, whether you're a very large office like ours, or I know a lot of institutions have, you know, one or two person shops, um, you, you're really focused on trying to implement a lot of best practices and to develop strategies for dealing with things, you know, before problems bubble up. Um, so it's really important to work with, um, you know, various different offices around campus and, and to have really close partnerships with people so that you could start to put uh, some of these best practices into place. We've been really lucky to work with Leslie um, and with, with some other members of this team um, who are very eager to do the same thing because they want to get it right and, and are committed to, you know, to doing things the right way to, um, you know, to really building up a workable construct so that, um, you know, we can um, really work through any difficulties before they turn into giant problems. Um, and so there are a couple of key ways in which we've collaborated and I think it is, is probably a good model for other institutions to use in, in trying to think through issues. Um, but the one point I want to stress in going through these is that, um, you know, I, I understand that attorneys are sometimes scary and, and people don't want to reach out to them. Um, and it, it's really much better to get that sort of consult in early on so that, um, you know, we can work with you, we can help to develop it. We're, we're always going to be happy to, to talk about these things early on rather than, you know, a five o'clock call saying, oh, we, you know, we think that there's some massive lawsuit headed our way. Um, so the first uh, area, as Lisa had mentioned, that, that we really work together um, is in the development of a policy. Um, and having policies on issues as complex as this um, make just a ton of sense. Um, you, you want to have people throughout the community understand what they have to do, understand um, what all the requirements are, and understand who they can go to if they need more information. Um, the, the problem with, um, you know, the, or the flip side of this with, um, with something as complex as this is that it's not the easiest thing in the world to read or to follow. Uh, so you want to be sure that the product that you're putting out is a workable product and it's an understandable product. Um, we have, as Lisa mentioned, a pretty rigorous review process where we socialize it to different people. Um, and legal affairs plays a big role in that as well in, in trying to make sure that the, the language is understandable, it can be followed and implemented. Um, when you expose it to a, a broad audience, you, you get people um, to have some buy-in to it as well, um, that they understand it and, and that they, you know, really accept it and want to work with people about it. And that's always great whenever you're dealing with something like this. Um, so for those of you that are thinking about developing a policy or, um, you know, thinking about trying to put it in place, I would, I would strongly encourage you to reach out to the legal departments at your institutions or to reach out to other key stakeholders to start to develop that so that you can create a product that I, I think our policy is that um, is understandable, workable, that you can pinpoint where the areas of concern might be ahead of time and really work through those. 
Um, the next area that is uh, probably sort of obvious is legal requirements. Um, I know Leslie has reached out to us on a number of occasions whenever we're dealing with another state. Maybe it has some sort of wonky law that requires you to do something crazy or it's just something that's not particularly clear. No one wants to be in court battles, you know, across the country. And so, you know, presenting those issues as early as possible, um, you know, building up the, um, the trust and collaboration with with legal affairs or, or um, you know whatever attorneys you may have um, so that you can ask those questions and then they can understand that you know um, you, you need clear advice to help you be able to do your job to help them be able to do their job um, is really really important so you know be cognizant of that be cognizant of their time and um, and you know, nine times out of ten, people are going to be you know just thrilled that you came to them early on with something uh, to help work through it. Uh, another area that we've really worked through and may not be as obvious for legal affairs is uh, communications. Uh, a lot of times. Um, you know, state authorization issues deal with setting expectations of students as to, you know, what can they do, what sort of programs can they get into. You, you, nobody wants to be in the position where a student thinks that they're going to be certified as a nurse or, you know, as, as something else. Um, and, you know, they've completed a program and then they find out, oh, we're in the wrong state, we can't do this. Um, and so, you know, setting those expectations through clear communications on websites, through clear communications on application materials um, is really important. And, and that's something that we've worked with Leslie and, and with other people on her team with as well um, to review communications, to review that, uh, to review, um, you know, information that's going out to people. Is it setting the right expectation? Is it over promising something? Is it in accordance with the law? Um, so those are just some of the big areas that um, you can really work with on, um, you know, with legal affairs and with others. Um, like I said, we're, we're generally, as, as scary as attorneys may seem to be, we're generally pretty happy to work with you and pretty happy to collaborate and can also be a source for bringing you in, uh, in touch with other people across the campus. We, we tend to work with people across a broad um, range of offices just necessarily due to our work so we can help put you in touch with um, with people in, in different areas that may be able to help. Great job, Brandon. And I can attest that Brandon is not scary at all. In fact, he takes my phone calls at all hours. So yeah, definitely reach out to legal counsel if you have that opportunity at your institution. Uh, next up, we have Skylar Fott, uh, our marketing and communication specialist. Market, or uh, Skylar, take it away. All right, hi everyone. Um, like Leslie said, I am Skylar Fott. I am the Marketing and Communication Specialist in our Office of Distance Education and E-Learning. Um, so essentially my job is to help expand distance education and improve retention for our current online students across Ohio State through marketing campaigns and communication strategies. Um, and so for about the year that I've worked for Ohio State, I've really seen that all the work I do is impacted by state authorization because obviously our university needs to be in compliance for distance education and our online programs to work and really serve our students. So I wanted to touch on just two pieces of work that I've helped with related to state authorization that have really assisted us to build and strengthen our relationships around the university. So first, I wanted to touch on the communication strategy that we put together for the out-of-state educational activities policy. Um, so during that process, something that I helped with as the communication specialist is providing review and insight on the policy while it was going through its many versions. So I provided my review um, and I really looked at it through the lens of our common person across the university, just a faculty and staff member, who might not know all the nitty gritty details about state authorization. Um, and so once the policy was ready to um, go public and be live, um, we worked to develop an awareness campaign um, to share this out with the university and have them understand the impact that it would have on everyone's work. Um, and so this was a comprehensive awareness campaign. Um, and we used channels that we knew um, employees consumed their normal information through um, with a key message that was really that this policy is a positive step in the right direction for our students, faculty, and staff, 
but it will impact some of the day-to-day -day work um, that people are doing. So some of the channels we used to make sure that we were communicating with our stakeholders across the university came in three different types. Um, so the first thing that we used was top-down communication. So these were newsletters from leadership, daily emails from the university, and then working with Ohio State's marketing team to get on their um, channels like their social media accounts. So then we also used um, online communication channels. So these were like our office's social media accounts, um, platforms that are used university-wide like Yammer and Listservs, um, creating website articles for our ODEE website, creating videos and graphics to help make the policy and this information understand for our stakeholders. Um, and then also Leslie and Lisa hosted some uh, webinar information sessions that were really like Q&A sessions where people could get information directly about the policy and the impact that it would have. Um, and then the final channel that we used to communicate out this policy and make sure our stakeholders were informed was um, a print direct mailer. And the reason we did this is, was because we wanted to reach all of our faculty and staff members, not leave anyone else out and um, cover all of our bases, which included our regional campuses. So we completed that awareness campaign and it was successful. So now we're moving into uh, more operational work that I consider our outreach activities um, with the goal of keeping the entire university and our stakeholders up to date with relevant authorization information. So this means reminding people of the policy, our reporting procedures, um, any changes or updates to compliance or um, the policy, and just making the information overall easy to understand and relatable. Um, so as Lisa mentioned earlier, we have three specific activities that we do with communication to keep our uh, stakeholders up to date. Um, so those are monthly newsletters that we put out through a tool called MailChimp. Um, we write articles monthly that go on our ODEE website and then get shared out through other newsletters, on our social media accounts, other platforms. And then we keep our three web pages up to date, our traditional students page, our online students page, and our faculty and staff page, um, just so if anyone is going there at any time, they have the right up-to-date information. And so one of the reasons why I have seen success in how we've built our relationships with our stakeholders and how we've continued to really keep everything in a positive light um, is that we share the why of what is happening and not just the what. Um, obviously, everyone can see state authorization is important. Um, it needs to happen at our university. But once you show them the why and the impact, that makes all the difference. And it really inspires stakeholders to stay in the loop, remain in compliance, and um, feel like they can reach out to you and understand the information and what they need to know. And now I'll give it back to Leslie. Thank you, Skylar. Fantastic job. I also realize a lot of institutions don't have marketing and communications at their fingertips. It is a privilege that we have, and we're very grateful for Skylar um, and her work that she's contributed. So next up, we have Ansel Oakley, who works in the Office of Institutional Research and Planning. So I'm going to turn it over to Ansel. Thank you, Leslie. Um, I was fortunate enough to meet Leslie and some of her staff back in 2015. And this came about um, marrying our two departments together with the Maryland Higher Education Commission, um, where they shared that um, the institute seemed to provide data regarding supervised internships, practicums, field experiences for online on the ground programs, um, et cetera, to Maryland by June 30th, 2015. So we had a very short window where we need to gather up all this data and then report it out. Um, like most institutes, um, getting our data is always quite interesting, but fortunate for us, um, my department, Institutional Research and Planning, has a great relationship with our registrar's office where we worked with them very closely to ensure that when we were collecting the data, retrieving it, that we're following the same um, principles and guidelines that they do when they pull their iPads data, which we were supposed to mirror at that time. Um, so as we pull the data, we noticed that some of it looks a little interesting, like at most institutes. So we um, henceforth created um, data sheets that we could then send off to the various departments uh, to confirm that the data looked correct 
and for them to update it and to send it back to us. Um, they also needed to provide the sites where um, their placements had occurred that was not collected, where people stopped school, so we weren't capturing that data at the time. Um, some of our online courses we knew from a study we did a few years ago that sometimes people entering the data each semester forgets to label courses distance learning or in person. So we would then shoot that data off for validation from the departments as well. So with the help of Leslie and her staff creating these bridges between our department and the various colleges and departments, we've successfully have been able to capture our data fairly accurately over the past several years. Um, historically, we have shared spreadsheets upon spreadsheets of data. Um, this year, we're hoping to get our website up and going where some of the departments that have their own data analysts, they can upload their own spreadsheets or if they need us to pull the data, they put a request form in. I'll pull the data and we'll get it sent off to those departments for verification. Um, all working um, very closely with Registrar's Office to ensure that we're doing this timely and in an efficient manner. Um, also, our success with the Registrar's Office has helped to clean up um, some of the data fields that we need, um, primarily being addresses. So a student who's enrolled in distance learning, when they enroll in a course, they now get a box that pops up and asks the students each semester to verify their address. Where before we had to go through multiple rounds of trying to find a student's um, current address, where are they at um, for the placement, distance learning, um, which became a little convoluted, but we're expecting this semester to go off pretty easy with this new update. Um, let's see, some of the other stuff that we're working on this year is um, creating a process mapping project where we're going to go through and map the entire project from the institutional research perspective of attaining the data. Also from Leslie's team for their process, we'll combine it together so we understand a fuller picture of all the work that we're putting into this. And also it will help prepare us as we move forward to a new SIS system for Workday where we will share this with our IT department and they'll help implement our needs and make sure that we get all the data needed for this request. Um, so it's been a wonderful marriage, I think, between all the departments across the university and Leslie has really made this uh, a very successful venture as we've been working on this going on our fourth cycle right now. And I'll pass it back to Leslie. Oh, thank you, Ansel. And Ansel is, uh, he plays a really large role in data collection and works tirelessly for our area. So thank you so much for that. Uh, next, we're going to turn it over to Mary McLaughlin, who works in the College of Food, Agricultural, and Environmental Sciences, and plays a large role in collecting uh, placement data for students completing experiences outside of Ohio. So I'm going to turn it over to Mary to talk about her experience with state authorization and what a giant role she plays for her large department. Thanks, Leslie. Um, so, as Leslie mentioned, I'm in our Food, Agricultural, and Environmental Sciences College, and in our college we have a lot of programming going on outside of the state. Our college requires all of our students to complete internships as part of the degree program, and so many of those students as part of the internship program um, choose to take internships outside of the state of Ohio. And additionally, we have some distance ed programs in our college that's a growing area. We have two grad programs and many online courses. So throughout our college, the uh, state authorization is a key area that we have been interested in and making sure that we're being compliant. And we've been developing a relationship with the state authorization team and Leslie over the past couple years um, to make sure that we understand what we need to do in order to be compliant. So we have multiple team members here in our college that are covering these areas, internships and distance learning. We have our regional campus, our Columbus campus, and then our distance authorization individual that are all represented on the state authorization advisory council, where we're getting information from Leslie and her team on um, updates on state authorization and any questions we have about it can be answered in those sessions. And then we're able to bring all that information back to our colleagues within the departments in our college, both in Columbus, 
um, at our regional campus and then our distance education folks as well. Um, so I work very closely with all of our internship coordinators in the college that are sending students around the United States to complete internships. And as the state authorization policy was rolled out at the university, we asked Leslie and her team to come in and meet with our internship coordinators, to kind of hold an info session where they could learn more about the process, about what state authorization was and why it was important for us to be compliant as a college and university. And um, Leslie was great and was able to provide a lot of information and answer any questions that they had. And that really helped us to get them to be excited about being involved in the process and their understanding of why it was important for our students. So through that, we were able to develop a Qualtrics form, just a survey that the internship coordinators have all of their students fill out prior to starting their internship, that they're gathering information on where and when the students are completing their internships. Um, that helps us with tracking and reporting that information back to the state authorization team. Um, it's also been really helpful in developing additional advising tools and recruitment tools for us. So it has um, multiple uses after we're collecting that data, and it's allowed us to streamline the process of collecting data in our college, whereas before everything was done at the department level, and although the departments are still doing most of their own, we do now have a streamlined process where we can all be on the same page on where our students are going and what they're doing to complete their internships. So it's been really helpful for us as a college, and throughout the process, We've worked really closely with the state authorization team um, and through the different communication aspects that they've discussed, uh, such as the advisory board, their newsletters, we've been able to stay up to date and to keep all of our departments and programs um, up to date so that we can make sure we're reporting the information that's needed when it's needed. So across the board, it's been a um, really great process in our college, and a lot of that's due to the help that we've been able to get through the state authorization team. And I'll just great. hand it back Thank over you. to Leslie. Yep. Thanks. Thanks, Mary. And now I'm going to turn it over to one of my favorite faculty members, Dennis Cleary. Uh, he's in the Occupational Therapy Division for the School of Health and Rehabilitation Sciences. Thank you, Leslie. And I think I'm your favorite because I think I was the first one to call you, uh, I think on day three or day four when you were at the university. Um, so uh, in occupational therapy, we place about 300 students uh, nationally. So we recruit students nationally. We like to place students nationally as well uh, in some international placements. And so um, the American Occupational Therapy Association actually did a really nice job of preparing us that this legislation was coming and that we needed to make sure that um, our universities were getting prepared. Um, when I was kind of moving things up the chain within, we're in the College of Medicine, um, sort of what they were hoping was that there would be some type of a legislative um, fix so that uh, clinical placements would not be affected by the, um, by the legislation. But obviously that did occur. And so um, we got a, um, a paper. It wasn't even an email. So there was no paper trail. Uh, Brandon, I don't know if you were involved in the new paper trail or not, but um, so it was a, a piece of paper that had this list of 20 states that we were not authorized to, to place students in, and it came for me about six weeks before students were ready to, to go out and do placements, and so um, I called Leslie and uh, uh, talked to her a little bit and informed the students that, that really, um, at this point, they weren't going to be able to, to complete those placements. They weren't happy. I called Leslie back, and um, one particular student actually called uh, a state regulator in Georgia uh, and asked why she couldn't come and do her, her clinical placement in the great state of Georgia. Um, he uh, knew Leslie through, through some of the national networks, um, called her, agreed to do a teach out. And so that's when you get um, permission for you know, a limited number of students to go ahead and complete their, their clinical rotation, in our case, uh, within that state, and then ask that we not have our students call uh, him anymore. So we've, we've tried to um, maintain that as best we can. So um, I helped to um, write and give feedback on the policy and now serve on the, the committee to help um, us and help uh, other people within the College of Medicine really understand Sarah. We're really um, fortunate now that, you know, we are authorized uh, for most programs uh, in all 50 states. And so that's a really a uh, nice thing to be able to um, use as a way to both recruit students and also to, to be able to use all the 
the clinical sites that we want. And Leslie and Lisa and their team have just been really phenomenal for us to, to work with. And I know some of my colleagues at other universities uh, across the country are even having to call um, you know, state regulators on their own for particular students. And obviously that should be something that's outside of the faculty members' responsibility. So um, again, can't say enough great things about the committee and Leslie and Lisa and how great they've been to work with. Thank you so much, Dennis. And now I'm going to turn it over to Vicki Miller, who uh, works in our uh, financial aid office. So, Vicki? Hi. Um, so, I second everything that everybody said about the great partnership that we have established with our state authorization team. They're super helpful. And even if your institution doesn't have that type of resource, um, hopefully you have somebody on your campus that's as knowledgeable as our team is because they're very helpful when issues come up. From a financial aid perspective, um, state authorization, of course, is important to us in our role for administering aid. Um, some of the things that can impact the university if you're not in compliance with state authorization is our um, risk of loss of accreditation. Uh, it can impact your reputational risk as an institution. Um, your Title IV eligibility is at risk, which then in turn can affect enrollment and have other financial and academic impacts across the university. And in some cases, financial penalties are possible as well. So it's really important that the institution understands um, the importance of maintaining compliance in state authorization. And that's one of the things that this committee provides is a great tool for all the different stakeholder areas to come together and talk about their different perspectives and the way that state authorization impacts them. Um, some of the reasons why financial aid and the Department of Education are so concerned, um, of course, are like the opportunities for fraudulent practices. Um, and that's particularly important in distance education. Um, and then from a consumer disclosure perspective, financial aid has a lot of responsibilities for ensuring that students are provided accurate information about the quality of academic programs and um, ensuring that programs we have in place prepare for gainful employment. And then another main one that's come into focus over the past few years is the ability to address complaints. So if a student has a complaint about your institution or the program that they're attending, um, they need to know where to be able to register that complaint. And that's one of the ways that our offices kind of partner together is that the state authorization team actually houses the consumer information related to complaint process on their website. So we have resources that link a student from the financial aid website to their website so that they have access to all the information that we're supposed to be providing to them as an institution. Um, and that's also where having the state authorization team manage agreements like our SARA agreement, that helps us have confidence that we are in compliance and that we are approved where we have students. And um, it just really helps kind of complete the loop on compliance. Um, and so really, I think everybody else, I'm just second, seconding what everyone else has said. The, you can't say enough about how important stakeholder relationships are, and we have a great one with our state authorization team, so thank you. Thank you so much, Vicki. And our last presenter today is Ryan Hunt from the Registrar's Office. Ryan? Hello. Um, I, I guess I'd, I'd follow what Vicki said and, and really echo all the comments about uh, having a great partnership across campus. My role as, as Associate Registrar uh, for the Academic Records and Course Scheduling has put me in a unique spot to, to really help um, a lot of the folks uh, across campus not only get a little more awareness of this, um, but uh, being able to provide some tools. So as, as Ansel uh, alluded to earlier, we one of the big things we've done recently is um, provide some some mechanisms within our student information system to uh, have students reaffirm where they're physically located. Uh, this is especially important for those 
who are only taking online courses uh, or, or uh, otherwise placed out of the uh, out of the state, um, uh, trying to to um, follow what students do is is really difficult at any college campus across the country. So um, being able to leverage technology wherever we can is something that uh, we try to help with. Um, as we move to an enterprise project installing a new uh, software system for both our, our finance, HR, and our student information system, uh, I, I continue to try to make sure folks are aware of this. Um, uh, Sarah is not necessarily the first thing that comes to mind when when folks are thinking about uh, all of the different regulations on a on a university campus, um, but obviously it's really important at a at at an institution of any size, um, but especially one like like ours at Ohio State. It's it's so large and complex. Um, there's so many regulations folks have to 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 keep track of. Um, this is is such an important one, uh, and. The other thing that that registrar's offices can can really do is help bridge some of those gaps between the uh, IT world, the academic world, and the administrative world. Because uh, registrars are, are are constantly stuck in the middle of all three of those worlds. So being able to uh, to provide a good partnership uh, across those and and be good stewards of having accurate records uh, is is something that's it's near and dear to registrar's uh, hearts, um, but I know that it's uh, it's something that wherever we can make uh, li things easier for um, faculty to do the important job of teaching students and students to not have to worry about um, regulations that just be able to, to do the learning is, is really, really key. Um, we are certainly lucky that uh, our Office of Distance Education and E-Learning has such a, a, a wealth of talent and really have spearheaded this on this campus. I've, I've worked with Sarah and other campuses, um, but nothing has been as proactive and really uh, had that, that wanting to build partnerships is, is so vital and, and uh, they've really done a tremendous job. Thank you so much, Ryan. Sure. And Cheryl, Cheryl, I'm going to turn it over to you for questions. Great. Thanks, Leslie. I am um, really impressed with the team that has been assembled here to talk to everyone today. Not only am I seeing interactions with um, with Leslie's office, but I'm seeing interactions among themselves. Um, it seems that there's some pairings there that also are helping different aspects of um, the work get accomplished. Uh, we do have several questions, and because we're um, just a few minutes to the top of the hour. I want to make sure we get to these questions. And please know that if you submitted a question in the question box and we don't get to it, I will get these questions answered for you. And these questions will get these answers will get back to everybody. So we'll start with the first one. And this one is back to Lisa. Lisa, what are the areas that are represented on the advisory committee and how many members? Um, let's see, our advisory committee, I believe, has 13 members now, and many of the committee members are on this call today. So we have some faculty, um, the registrar's office, the Office of Institutional Research and Planning. Um, we have a couple of graduate students on the committee. Um, am I forgetting anyone, Leslie? Did you, you said graduate students. Uh, no. And then we have the College of Food and Agricultural Science, which uh, we have various representation there uh, because we have some remote people that also work remotely from that college. Great. Thank you very much. Moving to the next question. Lisa, this is to you as well. What are examples of the types of advice you have sought from your advisory committee and how have they helped in your decision making? Um, let's see. We've had a lot of discussion lately about the federal regulations that are pending and how Ohio State is planning to be in compliance by the, with those regulations, assuming that they are going to take effect next July. 
Um, we've also talked about the states that have not yet joined SARA and what our status is in those states and what our strategy is um, going forward to be in compliance with the regulations in those states. Um, we, we've talked about international compliance um, and the regulations that we're aware of internationally and how Ohio State will address those regulations and enrolling international students. Um, and really the feedback that we get from committee members is just from perspectives um, all across the university, like I mentioned, our committee members have really diverse backgrounds um, so it just helps to kind of talk through the issue and to talk about our options going forward. Great, thank you, Lisa. Um, before I uh, read the next question, I just want to note here that here's some contact information if you have follow-up questions that you realize 15, 20 minutes after the webinar is over. Um, you'll see here at the bottom the state authorization team um, back at Ohio State uh, that you can reach out to them as well through this uh, email address. Okay, this next question is for Mary. Is the internship tracking tool developed in-house or by a third party or something else? Um, it's developed in-house. I developed it. Our university uses Altrex. It's a survey developing tool. And so I used that and worked with our internship coordinators to make sure we are capturing some additional information they wanted about their patient. Great. Thank you mm -hmm. very much. Okay, Thanks. moving to our next question. Um, and this is to anyone who wishes to answer it. Are there any cases of having to license nurses or others to comply? And if so, who paid the fees? Sure, either Lisa or I could speak to that. Um, Lisa, I don't know if you want to answer that, but essentially, okay. Basically, that would be up to the College of Nursing to decide how we would proceed forward should there be fees associated with, with um, getting faculty licensed in a state or actually completing an application. So our nursing department would basically review how many students had applied from that state and assess if there's going to be a return on the investment for actually going through that application process. Thank you. Okay, um, can Ryan provide an explanation on how OSU has the students reaffirm their physical location? Is it a pop-up on their course registration window, for example? Yeah, I, I won't be able to get into too much of the, the technical details, but um, uh, it is a pop-up that will come up prior to registration. Um, we turn it on and turn it off during certain times during the registration period. Um, so it's not out there all the time. Uh, we, we really looked for um, having it open as close to uh, when the semester starts as possible, but um, uh, you know, it's not a, probably 100% accurate, but it, it, it gets us much closer uh, as from, a, from a data perspective. Uh, like I said earlier, it's always, it's always difficult to track down students and get them to get you the information you need. Um, but yeah, it's, it's basically a pop-up window as they go in to, to enroll. Thank you very much. Okay, um, given the time, I do want to point out that there are four or five questions left, and please do not worry. We will get those questions answered for you and uh, sent, by, sent back out to you. But at this time, I also want to point again to these uh, email addresses. If you have any questions, you can reach out to us and to Ohio State. And I'd like to thank um, very much the Ohio State University for putting together this team of folks to be able to share with us the importance of interactions at an institution. I, I think it was very valuable for us to hear from the key stakeholders aspects that they believe that this relationship is important as well. This is a little bit about WCET. Um, you, um, if those of you that are not familiar, you can find more information about SAN 
um, on the SAM uh, web pages within WCET. And also, I would ask you to have a look at the Frontiers blog. You'll find good information on a regular basis provided there. Russ Poulin edits the WCET Frontiers blog. Several blogs come out um, within a month's span, and uh, they, they range on a wide variety of higher ed topics. Uh, finally, we do have some uh, more um, activities that will be in the near future. We have the part three of our series, which will be next month, and that is going to be how you as an institution can reach out and inform these key stakeholders, and also uh, the compliance workshop coming up and the annual meeting. And finally, I'm going to turn this back over to um, Megan to close us out. And I want to thank you all again for being here. And uh, thank you, Leslie. And thank you, all of you wonderful presenters from Ohio State, for your very informative um, lessons for us to learn today. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Cheryl. And I'll just go ahead and wrap it up since we are at the top of the hour. But this is a wonderful presentation, certainly meaningful to the SAN network. So if you have any questions, reach out to the wonderful resource resources that spoke today and stay tuned for more information about WCT events, including SAN events. Thanks so much. <laughs>